Hi, this is Nicole Kupchik and this is 10 Minute Tidbits. I'm here with Dr. Bill Reed, who's been a cardiothoracic surgeon for over 25 years. Hello, Dr. Reed. Hi, Nicole. <laughs> All right, so this is our second segment we're doing. I interviewed Dr. Reed in the last segment. We talked about just kind of surgical surgeries he likes and approaches and ones and different surgeries that kind of make him a little hesitant, you know, although he's he jumps right in with a lot of these surgeries. Right. But what we want to talk to about today is the post-op care of of patients who have had coronary artery bypass, maybe post valve or aortic dissection. So, all right, patient comes out of the OR. Okay. And right. you've already said, control their blood pressure, watch for bleeding. Blood sugars. Blood sugars. Yeah. Keep them less than 180, maybe less than 150 in some patients. All right, so immediately post up. Let's talk about bleeding first of all. Okay. Okay. So you take a patient off bypass. How do you, when they go on bypass, they need to heparin, correct? So, so to put them on bypass, we have to give them a, a big dose of heparin, usually okay. 20, 25,000 units. That's a big dose of heparin. Okay. Right. Yeah. To, take, to take them off bypass, once we're satisfied everything looks good, we'll give them a dose of protamine, which will correspond to that particular dose of heparin. But the problem is, is that protamine doesn't last as long in the system as heparin does. So Ooh, it's not okay. uncommon that people sometimes have what's called a protamine rebound, uh, a heparin rebound, which okay. is because the protamine stops working. Um, and what we'll see is that the chest tube output will start to pick up. Usually it's three or four hours after they get back to the ICU. Um, the nurses uh, have kind of been forewarned that if they see something like that, they should check a PTT. And if it's elevated, we may give a little extra dose of protamine just to, okay. to try and slow them down. So it's about three to four hours post-op. Right. That's really a good marker for a lot of you who take care of these patients to kind of understand is just the how long the effects of protamine last and that you can get that rebound and patients can start to bleed and become coagulopathic. Right. Okay, all right, what else? So, so if some, let's say a nurse has a patient who's bleeding, what types of things should he or she look at or, or think about? Well, so, so the reason to be concerned about bleeding is that there's the potential that they could have a tamponade. So you want to make sure that the oh, chest yeah. tubes are, are patent. Um, that may involve stripping them or it may involve suctioning them out. Okay. You want to make sure that the patient's not developing signs of tamponade, which would be low blood pressure, uh, low cardiac output, yeah. something that would indicate that the patient's uh, 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 cardiac output's suffering because of the okay. blood that's accumulating around the heart. And then um, you want to know if there's any factor deficiencies. Do they need platelets? Do they need plasma? Do they have some residual drug uh, like heparin still circulating okay. that, that needs to be reversed? Now you use TEG quite a bit, quite a bit right? I, I have used it in the past, right? Yeah. yeah. And so TEG is it's basically it's a test that you can do to figure out exactly kind of how your blood is clotting. Is that correct? It, it is, but it, it also has the potential. It's unusual in the sense that it has the potential to look at platelet function. And oh, so okay. we can we can look at the, the clotting system pretty accurately with protimes and, and mm -hmm. fibrinogen levels, but the platelet function is the one thing that we can't really address. And the more time, the longer the bypass run, or the if they've been on uh, Plavix or Berlinta before mm -hmm. surgery, yeah. those those platelets probably are not working as well. And so it gives us a, a quantification of how how functional the platelets are yeah. and what we need to do to to uh, correct the uh, the deficiency if it's a problem. Yeah, and that's a really good thing to think about because when you use TEG, your platelet count might be okay, but you've got impaired platelets. So even though you've got an okay platelet account, you might still need to give platelets, correct? Exactly. You might, you might yeah. have 100,000 platelets, but if they're only 50% effective, that means mm -hmm. you only have 50,000 functioning platelets, yeah. which which would be an indication to give platelets if somebody's starting to bleed. Yeah, and do you ever get push bank, uh, I'm sorry, pushback from the blood bank about that? Well, you know, the, the labs that are comfortable with TEGs learn to respect them, and they actually yeah. end, up, they end up saving uh, blood products because historically a lot of surgeons would just routinely sort of point blank just give platelets and just give them yeah, yeah. and uh, we, we haven't had to do that with the tag so we I think we save the blood bank money in the long run so oh, we okay. document the need that the person needs platelets if they're actively bleeding you know we might we might sit on a platelet count of 80,000 if the patient's not bleeding but if he starts bleeding that's certainly one of the things we're going to want to address yeah okay and then what about temperature so do you try to warm patients up in the OR before they go to the ICU or right. what does that look like well so so we typically of course they're on the bypass machine most of my most of my coronary bypasses are done on bypass. So we have the ability to warm them or cool them wherever mm -hmm. we want. And the perfusionist always tries to get them back to 37 degrees prior to taking out the cannulas. But occasionally there can be some drift. So okay. frequently we'll bring somebody back and we'll get a, the first temperature. It might be 36 or 30, 35.5 or something like that. Okay. In which case we would throw a bear hugger on them or some sort of a warming yeah. device to get them warm back up. 
uh, the colder they are, the more likely they are to bleed. To become, yeah, yeah coagulopathic and bleed even more. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think that's a really good point. Okay. So now let's say this, maybe we've got the bleeding under control. Oh, wait. One other thing I want to mention as far as bleeding is fibrinogen. Because I think a lot of nurses don't under, don't totally get this concept, but um, fibrinogen is one of the labs you should look at right. to decide if the patient needs cryoprecipitate. Exactly. Yeah, and so um, what, what uh, fibrinogen level makes you say, "Ooh, let's get some cryo." So, so three hundred is the is the threshold for normal. Typically, less than two hundred, I'll go ahead and mm. give it to them. Just get cryo then. Yeah. yeah. If if I have somebody that's actively bleeding and they're less than three hundred, I'll go ahead and give it to them. Okay. Yeah, yeah and I, I I love this. Somebody um, I went to a lecture a few years ago and somebody said think of cryo as like liquid fibrinogen you know so it's just kind of a way to to think about cryoprecipitate okay all right so now let's say we've got the bleeding under control we're doing great um, what other things do you want nurses do, do you want to make sure nurses really understand let's talk about fluids first of all okay are too much is too much fluid bad or what do you think so so it used to be thought that you could give people fluid and it would have no no untoward effect or no sure. no bad uh, effects but that's yeah, they do. That's not that's not really the case. Every every CC you give somebody, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to account for down the road. And yeah. and it's not so much the CC, but if you give them a liter or five liters or ten liters, that's five or ten liters that is gonna slow their recovery, create problems down the road as far as kidney function, uh, mesenteric perfusion, things like that. So. So typically we try and minimize the amount of fluid we give them okay. for the resuscitation. So we follow the goal-directed approach, which means that we use, we do dynamic uh, challenges, we give fluid boluses, and if, it, if they show responsiveness to fluid, we might give more fluid. If they don't show responsiveness, then we know we have to go with either vasoconstrictors or inotropes from that point on. Mm -hmm. The idea is that we're trying to minimize the amount of fluid that they're getting so that in day two or day three, we have less fluid that we have to try and get back. And so when we, we will follow uh, the markers of end organ perfusion like SVO2 or, or lactate levels, as long as the lactate levels are diminishing, the SVO2s are in an acceptable range, then, then we're satisfied. Once they get a little bit further out from surgery, like in day one, uh, afternoon of day one, I'll typically start diuretics. Uh, depending on how much their weight is up, trying to get that fluid back. Okay, so as as much as you're resuscitating, you're also de-resuscitating these patients. Right. Well, they go through phases, and so yeah. there's there's a phase where they become they become very volume, um, you know, sensitive. They need the they need the volume, but beyond that point, any extra volume is is actually detrimental, and okay. it slows down. It causes problems in other areas mm -hmm. like uh, lung function, gut function, renal function. Sure. Um, some, in some extreme cases, it can cause wound healing problems and dehiscences and things like that. Yeah, okay, I think that's a really good point. And then tell me about your strategy for diuresing patients. Do you just give a loop diuretic? Do you push it? Do you give drips? Like, how do you manage that? So, so if, the, if the patient's not terribly fluid up, meaning if they're a kilo or two above, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll start them on diuretics in the afternoon of day one. You know, that may be fluid uh, push, or I'm sorry, Lasix pushes. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if they're five or six kilos up or more, then I'll start them on a Lasix infusion and uh, I'll aggressively diurese them. And if, if they don't make some progress by day two, I'll throw in some metolazone or switch to Bumex, depending on, uh, on just exactly how fluid positive they are and then how they're tolerating it. Okay. Um, there was some concern initially that we might be inducing renal problems, but I honestly think that we've seen our renal dysfunction rates drop, and, uh, and I think the reason for that is oh. that I think that the abdominal edema people get compresses the renal veins and affects the renal function. So the sooner we can get that excess fluid out of their abdomen, yeah. I think the more likely they are to get back to normal renal function. That completely makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it's the same thing with the gut. They have all that post-op nausea yeah. and, and uh, ileus and, and uh, just kind of refractory uh, anorexia. Okay. Yeah. And do you think some of it is from the third spacing of fluid? Yeah, I, I, I do. But I think that the place that, you know, we always talk about third spacing. Nobody knows where this third space is. But I mm -hmm. think the majority of it's in the abdomen, probably yeah. in the retroperitoneum. Yeah. And so that creates pressure, creates effects. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in severe cases when people are 10 or 15 liters to the positive, they get abdominal yeah. compartment syndrome. So why can't they have sort of a, a similar syndrome at yeah. lesser fluids sure. that has, maybe it has a milder detrimental effect, but it's still detrimental. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things um, I wanted to ask you about was um, the use of minadrine. And, and when you've got patients who are on vasopressors and you're having a hard time getting them off, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so, so a lot of times we'll see patients that have what we call post-operative vasoplegia. And they'll typically, we'll tighten them up 
during the first uh, six to 12 hours after surgery okay. with vasoconstrictors like um, uh, vasopressin or, or uh, uh, phenylephrine, uh, occasionally norepinephrine. Um, but on the day one, day two, you know, phase where we're trying to get them up and get them moving, we don't want them to get hooked up to a pump or on an infusion, so we'll, trip, we'll try and switch them over to something that's a little bit uh, uh, not so dependent on giving, uh, giving it constantly. So we use uh, midodrine, or, or, which is an alpha, it's an oral alpha agonist that tightens, oh. up the, tightens up the blood vessels. It's specifically used for uh, patients that have orthostatic hypotension, but it, it can be used off-label to, uh, to treat vasoplegia. So if I have a patient that has, has shown signs that they have low blood pressure, uh, but I know that they're markedly volume positive, I'll use that drug so, okay. that I can, so that I can expedite their diuresis. Nice. And then how quickly are you usually able to get their vasopressors off once you start it? Well, most of the, most of the time, it's th they're off within 12 hours. Um, occasionally, wow, that's pretty good. If, yeah, occasionally I'll have somebody that's mm -hmm. got poor, uh, poor systolic function to start with, and oh, I, might, okay. I might keep them on dobutamine for an extra yeah. day or two just to help wean. Um, sometimes, it rarely, we'll use norepinephrine if, for whatever reason, we think the uh, dobutamine is arrhythmogenic. Okay, I yeah. love it. I think, you know, these are some great tips. Is there anything else, I just a kind of in closing, any last minute tidbits that you would give nurses and respiratory therapists or pharmacists who are taking care of your post-op patients? Anything we should always kind of keep in the back of, your, of our heads? Well, honestly, I think the sooner we can get them extubated, I yeah. think their, their physiology normalizes. And mm -hmm. so I think a lot of the problems that we see after surgery, we, we're creating with drugs like uh, anesthetics that, you know, that are still hanging around from in the operating room oh, yeah. or whether we're using some sort of uh, pushes of uh, uh, Valium or, or Versed, I, I think the sooner we can get them extubated and get them awake and alert, then I think the more likely they are to, to be fast track players where where they can get up and get moving and their body sort of takes over its yeah. own mechanisms and things. Yeah, well, and it's, it's you know, and I'm just guessing a lot of the patients you do surgery on are a little older in age and delirium is such a problem in these patients. And they, always, they we, we used to call it pump head. Patients get confused post-operatively. Yeah. Do, do they still use that term pump head? Well, I, occasionally people come in and ask about it, but I, I agree with you. I think that more often what we're seeing is not so much the, the time on the bypass machine as it is the lack of sleep, the narcotics yeah. on board, the residual anesthesia. So if we can use non-narcotic pain control, um, a lot of times we can we can avoid the delirium, and yeah. particularly in the elderly, a lot of the problems have typically slow them down. Yeah, yeah, love it. Okay, love it. Anything else? In closing. No. Okay. Yeah. I feel so lucky to be able to interview him. So um, this is Dr. Bill Reed, and um, I just again thank you for sitting with me for the for a few minutes here and chatting about post-op patients. I think everyone's going to get a lot out of this. So. Okay. Well, thank you. All yeah. right. Well, I'm Nicole Kopchik, and this is Ten Minute Tidbits, and we are out from San Antonio.